Welcome to this keynote of Ignacio Bresco de Luna and Flor van Eifen. Uh, my name is Michael Watzlawick. I will be your moderator today. And I already invite you to use the Q&A tool at the bottom in the menu bar um, during the talk and also after to pose questions that I will then pass on to the two speakers of today's keynote. Ignacio is an associate professor at the University of Aalborg in Denmark, and Flor is a research fellow at the Faculty of Psychology of the Autonomous University in Madrid in Spain. Both work on collective memory, national identity, and history teaching. Um, they follow a cultural approach, a cultural psychology approach um, to these topics, working with narratives, and they are both currently living in Madrid in Spain. Um, the city is still under severe lockdown at the time, and compared to other regions in Spain, they can currently only go out uh, for a walk, for example, at eight, uh, between 8 and 10 a.m. and 8 and 11 p.m., and only with those they are living with. I'm very happy that they're here today for the talk that, um, with the title, The Imaginative Co-Construction of Past and Future in Pandemic Times, and I will uh, give the stage to them now and I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards with everyone. Dear colleague, if you receive this message, it means that our network is functioning well, fortunately given all the censorship and fake news nowadays. It also means that I've left Madrid, leaving my phone and other tracker devices behind. You might remember how the pandemic brought major politi uh, economic, political and social turmoil to Spain. And um, before the opposition forced the social democratic government to step down, the flow of information was still quite open. However, the bio-austerity measures imposed by the new right-wing coalition ushered in a, a new state of things. So, as expected, I lost my job, like most people working in social sciences and uh, humanities at the university. Because all funding for, for research and education was directed at um, medicine, information technology and so on. So, <laughs> you wouldn't believe how eager students were to make apps and handle swaps. Uh, instead, I got involved with uh, the Care Income Campaign and the Global Women's Strike, working for uh, an NGO based in Argentina, assisting women in situations of domestic violence, uh, which due to the pandemic had really gotten, really gotten out of hand and also organizing the care worker protests. My partner had to go south to work in agriculture, like most musicians and artists who really ran out of options. And now things have gotten really critical. It finally came out that uh, prominent members of the ruling political parties made deals with surveillance tech companies and uh, big pharma. And so they made millions forcing people to wear face masks and with uh, the new generation of traceable smartphones. So as you can imagine, civil unrest is huge uh, at this point. And the extreme right had already been gaining public support with their Recovering Spain campaign. And now, aided by the second Trump administration, they have staged a coup. Supposedly to liberate the people from health restrictions. This is what they say. Uh, my partner has been rounded up in Almeria along with other immigrant workers. 
and uh, it really doesn't matter whether you have a legal residency status anymore uh, if you're a non-european immigrant uh, you're be, you're considered illegal so also because of the air traffic restrictions uh, it's unclear uh, whether he will make it to argentina safely and also the feminist and care worker movements have had to go underground and today i received uh, news that i've been blacklisted so fortunately there's a uh, resistance networks in barcelona helping activists to get health passports and to cross the border to france over the pyrenees so that's where i'll be heading and with any luck i will make it to the netherlands but things are looking pretty bleak with the COVID-24 lockdown over there. So this is my last report from Madrid. Uh, I hope to re-establish contact with you on the other side of the tunnel. And for now, take care, all of you. Contrary to what is traditionally assumed in psychology, we humans do not just react to reality. We are goal-oriented beings, and as such we cannot help imagining possible futures, no matter how dystopian these futures might be, in order to guide our actions in the present. On the one hand, we imagine future scenarios through the symbolic resources available, and through our past experiences. On the other hand, those imagined futures filled with fears, hopes and expectations on to different possible scenarios, scenarios we want to attain or avoid, thus bringing with them desirable goals or warning signs through which we can assess the present and even review our past. George Orwell's famous dystopian novel, 1984, is a clear example of this. Written in 1948, after witnessing Stalinism and fascism during his participation in the Spanish Civil War, this novel still stands as a warning sign telling us how far our present society is from a possible totalitarian future, or how close we are to it in terms of fake news, language perversion, technological surveillance, etc. Taking Orwell's novel as an example, we may wonder then, how far from the dystopian situation reported at the beginning are we as a result of the coronavirus outbreak? Are we taking steps towards that imagined future scenario? This tendency to imagine future scenarios becomes even more evident whenever our flow experience is shattered by an unexpected change. When a crisis like the COVID-19 catches us off guard, we have the feeling of being thrown into an uncertain future. On the one hand, the rupture provoked by the virus outbreak makes our past experience of little use for imagining what the future might hold while, on the other hand, in the absence of a clear future scenario, the present seems to lack any directionality or purpose. At this juncture, Brunner's narrative approach may be of certain use. According to Brunner, it is through narrative that we can integrate the new and unexpected into something socially intelligible. Through narratives, past, present and future can be mainly linked thus bringing some sense to the current situation. If we take one of the last crises caused by an unexpected event, we can see how narratives as mini-making tools operate. Maybe some of you remember how 9-11 attack was shown on TV. Maybe you remember that despite repeatedly showing the same image of the plane crashing into the building, the meaning of what was happening wasn't clear. For the reason many specialists, or at least individuals regarded as such, were asked to provide a narrative to give sense to the images witnessed all over the world. Most of them turned to the past, talking for instance about the role of Bin Laden in Afghanistan in order to explain the present situation. But more importantly, they also talked about the future because in order to give full meaning to what was happening, it was also necessary to imagine the future scenarios this event could bring about and thus get people ready for a string of wars, invasions, etc. For the coronavirus crisis, we are told and even warned that we have to get ready for the future that is coming. But what future? When is the future going to start? 
is already here, leaving us no time to imagine it. In our view, the COVID-19 crisis combines two contradictory features. On the one hand, the social confinement, the lockdown of the population. At least in Spain, one of the most affected countries, life has been brought to a halt and put in a kind of parenthesis. Time seems to be frozen and encapsulated within an ever-repeating present, whereas our past way of living seems to be something that happened a thousand years ago, and the future hangs over our heads like a thread. In such a situation where people are at the mercy of government decisions, imagining the future becomes a necessary resource to mentally travel beyond the lockdown, to picture ourselves sunbathing on the beach this coming summer, or to figure out how to find a new source of income in the looming economic crisis. In this context, imagination can be understood as the process by which we temporarily decouple our flow of experience, leaving the here and now in a kind of a loop or short mental voyage before looping back to the present social reality. But, on the other hand, the rupture caused by the virus outbreak is opening up a scenario for change, with different social forces competing over how to imagine and construct the future after COVID-19. In other words, social confinement and paralysis of economic activity are taking place amidst extremely fluid times. So, despite the lockdown, time is not held in suspense. On the contrary, time is accelerating. So, while we are in our mental loop, imagining possible futures, things are rapidly changing, to the point that when we look back to reality, that reality will be quite different. So, maybe this way of understanding imagination doesn't completely fit in with the current pandemic times after all. Perhaps, rather than seeing imagination as an act through which we decouple from the here and now, we should bring the here and now to the very core of imagination. Taking a Marxist approach, it could be argued that it's precisely through the ongoing activity within specific material conditions that political consciousness can change and potential new futures can be imagined. For instance, spontaneous solidarity networks in neighborhoods might foreshadow new forms of community empowerment. Lockdown in world commerce and the whole in shopping activity help us to imagine a future not driven by the compulsive will of consumerism. Restrictions on people's movements and air traffic are delivering images of cities free of cars and mass tourism, not to mention international online conferences like this one. Needless to say, such an open scenario is also exploited by different actors pushing their own political agendas, Ala Noemi claims the shock doctrine. Let's not forget that lockdown has turned societies into a massive living lab to test people's reactions and adjustment to extreme measures taken in an extreme situation, which nevertheless might become naturalized once the pandemic is over. It is in the here-now situation created by the pandemic that, for instance, giant tech companies are trying to mold the image of the future. A future where technology will be permanently integrated into every single aspect of our lives. As one former Google CEO recently stated, the first priorities of what we are trying to do are focus on telehealth, remote learning and broadband. We need to look for solutions that can be presented now and accelerated, and use technology to make things better. Also, like in the aftermath of 9-11, attempts to channel the fluidity of the moment become apparent in the way competing narratives in the public sphere strive to make sense of the current situation, and by doing so, justify different lines of action and future scenarios. We find a wide range of narrative with various genres filled with heroes, villains, along with different moral lessons to be taken from the pandemic. Some of these narratives are framed in national terms, highlighting civic responsibility as an alleged hallmark of national character, or framing the situation as a war effort against a new and mighty enemy while other discourses embrace a global perspective advocating for transnational solidarity in the face of a virus that knows no borders. In 
the years will be shortened to months, and months to weeks, and weeks to days, and days to hours. According to the Christian medieval tradition, the shortening of time was a sign heralding the end of the world. These lines come from an apocalyptic text dating back to the period of the Black Death, in the 14th century, the worst pandemic recorded in human history, resulting in the death of over 300 million people in Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Apart from speculations about the future in the form of apocalyptic prophecies, the Black Death also brought forth speculations about the causes of the pandemic. In that case, the Black Death brought with it a renewed religious fanaticism, as many believed the pandemic was a punishment by God for their sins, while others targeted the Jews, accusing them of poisoning the wells in towns. The demographic decline caused by the Black Death also had significant socioeconomic consequences. Food prices dropped and land value declined. Landholders faced a great loss, while ordinary people not only saw prices going down, but also incomes going up due to labor shortage. Some historians argue that these changes contributed to destabilizing feudalism as an economic and political system. Some others even believe that the plague contributed to cooling the climate by freeing up land and encouraging reforestation. Let's compare now the previous apocalyptic text with the following statement uttered in 1886 by the electrical engineer and businessman Werner von Siemens. This clearly recognizable law is that of the constant acceleration of the current development of our civilization. Evolutionary cycles that in past times took centuries to unfold and that at the beginning of our time still took decades are completed today in years and often are born fully mature. This is the effect of scientific technical progress. Now, if we take these two examples, we can say that from a formal point of view, they both tell similar stories, on to the shortening of time, although in very different ways. The first example describes the shortening of time itself, preceding the end of the world according to the divine plans. The second describes an acceleration in how time is perceived as a result of new scientific and technological discoveries. We can see here a process of secularization in the way future is imagined. With the advent of modernity. Prophecies based on the notion of hereafter as something beyond secular historical time are replaced by the worldly notion of progress inserted in the historical time produced by humankind. However, not only did the way of imagining the future change with modernity, so too did the way of experiencing the past. In the Middle Ages, the present world comprising up to 80% of the population live within the cycle of nature. Technical innovations, which did exist, took a long time to become established, and thus did not bring about any rupture in the pattern of life. It was possible to adapt to these little changes without breaking with previously accumulated experience. As a result, the gap between past, present and future was minimal. Ruptures that went beyond all previous experience were not related to this world. Major pandemics, such as the Black Death, even wars, were treated as events sent by God. In contrast, the increasing technological changes brought about by modernity made expectations about the future become increasingly detached from all previous experiences of the past. The difference between experience and expectation was increasingly expanding to the point that the past experiences were no longer sufficient to imagine an increasingly uncertain future. According to historians such as Reinhard Koselleck or Francois Hartog, modernity brought about a new regime of time dominated by an increasing gap between experience and expectation, between past and future. People started to differentiate the past, the past already left behind, drenched with super superstition, hardship and darkness, from the present and the present from a future horizon marked by the promise of progress and other utopian dreams.
But what happens when the modern notion of future based on progress fades away? Future expectations based on the idea of progress seem to be shattered in late modernity. Despite being behind technological advances, we humans are at the same time overwhelmed and subjugated by their consequences. The death of utopias and their promise of a better world decline of the welfare state built upon the assumption that tomorrow will be better than today, globalization, the threat of climate change, increasing demands of a consumer society based on productivity, mobility, and technological innovation, as well as on immediate profit and the rapid obsolescence of things and people, all these factors have contributing to today's crisis of modernity, a crisis in which the future is becoming more and more uncertain if not threatening. This becomes even more evident in times of crisis. A rupture with the previous state of things, together with the uncertainty that opens up in the future, make past experiences insufficient to interpret the current situation, let alone to create expectations and bridges towards what is not yet given. We don't have time to think, plan or imagine the future, even though one of the technological promises was precisely to make more time available to us. In such cases, there doesn't seem to be much of a horizon beyond the present day, as the past becomes of little use for planning the future. According to the French historian Francois Hartog, the crisis in the modern regime of time seems to be giving way to what he calls presentism, a feeling of being stranded in the present an experience of time in which the present is omnipresent and the past fulfills an identity function rather than being a guide for planning the future. The face of threatening the future and an accelerated present beyond our control, we might be tempted to go back in time in trying to make the past great again, take back control, or more bluntly, to bring the past back to the future. Under circumstances of uncertainty, an accelerated change, people resort to nostalgia by clinging to an idealized past as if it were a teddy bear. Ultimately, nostalgia can work as an identity management strategy in response to threats to continuity. In fact, the rupture this virus outbreak has generated in relation to our previous way of living can make us feel nostalgic about the past, about the past so close and yet so distant at the same time. Imagination is inherent to humans. From religious prophecies and utopias based on technological progress, to dystopias based on the unforeseen gloomy consequences of human technology, imagination allows us to go beyond our current field of experience in order to guide our actions towards the future. It seems obvious that scientific and technological advances have been gaining ground in the way we project different possible futures whether as desirable horizons worth attaining or as grim scenarios to be avoided. Something explored through the concept of socio-technical imageries. For instance, with the advent of nuclear energy and its military use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, science and technology took on a major role in shaping new collective imagined futures. The visuals of the nuclear, the mushroom cloud, devastated cities, the nuclear reactor, the radiation symbol, etc. traveled worldwide and immediately became a global imagery generating new social representations of science and at the same time a set of iconic artifacts for remembering the past vis-à-vis -vis potential futures we would like to build or avoid as the human species. It is quite likely that the COVID-19 crisis will end up having a similar impact in generating global imageries about science and its role in dealing with pandemics and technology through the new ways of social surveillance via tracking apps. Together with nuclear disasters and climate change, 
Pandemics will probably become part of the new global threats hanging over our future as a human species. Threats that, as we move deeper into the Anthropocene, compel us to review our previous way of living in order to secure a viable future for the next generations. Because in a no-future society, the present is the only playground that matters and the very concept of responsibility falls. Ethical responsibility for the future implies, then, anticipating inevitable changes, particularly those involved in personal carbon reduction, and therefore assuming irreparable losses regarding certain ingrained habits, including dietary, consumption and traveling habits. As we said at the beginning, narratives can play an important role as symbolic resources through which to imagine different possible futures. According to Randall, climate change discourses present two parallel narratives. On the one hand, narratives warning us from the future where loss appears as a dominant theme. Loss of biodiversity, crop failure, water shortage, drought, fuel scarcity, resource wars, illness and famine, loss of livelihood, breakdown of civilization. However, no matter how catastrophic these future scenarios may be, for audiences of industrialized nations, they tend to be perceived as remote, either far in the future or geographically distant. They will happen to other people, in other places or in other times. The consequence is that these imagined scenarios are felt as unreal, just like the current pandemic outbreak at its initial stages, despite the previous pandemics that occurred in other parts of the world over the last decades. On the other hand, we find narratives where loss is split off from the present and projected into the future. The present continues to feel safe, but at the expense of the future becoming terrifying. In contrast to the apocalyptic representations of the future, this kind of narrative proposes a set of small, unchallenging changes, doing our bit, like changing from traditional light bulbs to LED lamps, encouraging green consumerism or embracing green technology, such as green energy. Ultimately, according to this view, progress in that direction, where loss scarcely features, will deliver a future world much like the one we know now, but even happier. As Randall points out, imagining the future is more necessary than ever in order to prepare ourselves for the inevitable changes we have to assume as humans. But for this to work out, there must be a certain belief that the loss is inevitable, a realistic time frame in which it's likely to happen, as well as support in dealing with the anxieties this will generate. This also requires firm political commitments that most, most politicians seem unwilling to make at present. In sum, we need to stop projecting changes into the future and make them real in the present. We need to stop both catastrophizing the future and wrapping the present in cotton wool, especially after seeing from the current pandemic that the latter is no longer possible.